Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. My previous video introduced the so-called unfinished pyramids of Zayet el Aryan and Abu Rawash, which I discussed at length and concluded they were not pyramids at all, but I proposed they were outflow locations for groundwater that was pumped across Egypt via the Great Pyramid. After reading through the comments, the video has certainly had a mixed reaction, but a comment from Keith Hamilton certainly caught my attention, and he led me to an outstanding paper he has written on the structure at Zayat al Aryan, and it is the most thorough investigation of the site available. I would strongly urge you to read it if you'd like to know more about the complete history of the site and the current state of knowledge. There is a link in the description below. The fantastic images included inside the study show a number of features I hadn't known about. There is an old aerial photo that shows that, like the structure at Abu Ruwash, the pyramid of Zayat el Aryan also had a perimeter wall, which confirms to me that the structure was indeed in a finished state, and was therefore never a pyramid, because you would never add a perimeter wall if you were still building such a colossal structure. It is worth noting that the stretch of wall to the west of the pit was constructed by Italian excavator Alexandra Bassanti to stop rubble and sand from flooding the site. Bassanti himself never identified this structure as a pyramid, but rather he was more inclined to think it was some kind of strange mastaba. Vasil Dobrev was convinced it was a sun temple, whilst author Robert Temple, in his book Egyptian Dawn, thought it had astronomical purposes. Keith Hamilton has also not come across any compelling evidence to confirm it is an unfinished pyramid, and he has certainly done a thorough study and analysis. Hamilton includes this fabulous sketch by Basanti that shows the tangled mess of limestone blocks that were thrown into the pit. This was the state of the structure on its discovery. After these blocks were removed, they were taken some distance away to the south for closer examination, where the many markings, including some of the cartouches discussed in my previous video, were found. As Basanti reached the bottom of the pit, he noted that the pavement blocks, some granite, some limestone, were connected together with a very solid mortar, and that there were areas of white plaster on the wall. On the western wall, there was a vertical red line in the centre, and another red line on the south wall, which was aligned to the median axis of the northern corridor. It is important to understand that even if the site wasn't in a military zone like it is today, it would still be a disastrous mess, as Basanti tore up the floor of the pit in his excavations. To understand the arrangement of the granite floor, which Basanti thought was hiding an underground burial chamber, he had some of the neighbouring limestone blocks cut into widths of 3 metres and removed. Jacks were then used to manoeuvre the 30 tonne granite block at the foot of the corridor, as Basanti hoped that would be the location of an entrance into a subterranean chamber. Underneath, he found another granite block, which Basanti describes as binding itself to the one above with a groove. It was clearly an expertly engineered structure. Barsanti then employed expert granite cutters from Aswan to force through the next block, which he was convinced barred access to a burial chamber. In total, 22 cubic metres of stone were removed, and interestingly, they did discover a block that seems to have been placed into position like a kind of cork, or plug. It was at the end of the corridor, at the entrance to the pit chamber, embedded between the east wall of the corridor, which was built with large blocks of granite, and a beautiful block that was part of the west wall. As it was placed directly onto the bedrock in the lowest level of masonry, Barsanti believed that this cork was the entrance to inner apartments. Barsanti was further convinced of subterranean chambers when a terrible storm brought three metres of flood water into the site. He noticed how the water level abruptly dropped as 380 cubic metres of water disappeared below ground, almost instantly. We know that the floor of the pit was made of four courses of stone, which was around 4.5 metres deep to the bedrock, which, by all accounts, was very hard stone. The granite and limestone blocks of the pit floor were huge, and tightly fitted together, as well as being tightly fitted against the walls. 
Although it was in the name of archaeology, Barsanti caused a great deal of carnage at the site. Shafts had been dug into the southern and western walls and the granite floor blocks were being dismantled as Barsanti frantically sought access to what he believed were underground chambers. But for all of the destruction, Barsanti did provide fantastic detailed diagrams of the masonry layout with some measurements. There are gaps and errors, but Keith Hamilton managed to recreate the pavement from Barsanti's observations. The dark blocks shown here are those made of granite, forming an L shape from the corridor to the famous oval tub, which I will get to shortly. Large limestone blocks surround those made of granite, and their courses are not of uniform thickness, but a complicated puzzle of interlocking blocks, which wouldn't be out of place in ancient Peru. One limestone block in particular weighed 43 tonnes, and the longest is more than 4 metres long. With very little accomplished or discovered, Barsanti had a five year break from excavating the site, but his final season would be the most destructive. He opted for the nuclear option to locate the hidden chamber, with the removal of limestone blocks away from the pit so that he could move and pile up the granite safely inside. In just one month, he managed to remove seven granite blocks, weighing a total of 231 tonnes. He eventually removed a massive 426 tonnes of granite. The removal of the blocks was difficult, and the mortar very tenacious, but in the end, Barsanti was defeated. The work was too labour-intensive, and the money had dried up. He did note that many of the blocks had notches on their eastern sides, showing that they were pushed into position from east to west, using levers. He noted how incredibly tightly the blocks were finished, and Basanti was convinced it was built to protect the mysterious oval tub, and anyone wanting to remove it would have had to have worked extremely hard. He did find one royal cartouche in all this destructive work on the block that adjoined the stone situated directly below the tub. It has been suggested that the name was a royal name, Nebkara. The history of Nebkara is not at all straightforward, and many now believe he is actually a mythical ancestor, or ruler, and not an actual king of Egypt. The onset of the First World War stopped any further excavation, and then Barsanti died in 1917. The blocks were never returned to their original locations, and the structure was left in ruins. From watching the 1955 movie, Land of the Pharaohs, the landing at the bottom of the corridor does appear to be clear, but we cannot clearly see the pavement that makes up the pit, and nobody knows what it is like today because the structure is used as a rubbish dump. After all of his incredible research, Keith Hamilton created this fabulous artist's impression of the site, and after everything I've read, I still believe it was originally built to be a giant water tank. Maybe the red vertical lines were used to measure the depth of the water, and they once had a scale attached to them. And maybe the blocks that made up the pit were so tightly packed together and mortared together so they could be watertight on completion. The pavement was a work of sheer perfection, and in the end it defeated Basanti, like some kind of impossible puzzle. It was built so precisely and securely for a reason. A huge amount of effort was put into this floor, and together with the oval opening and lid, it must have had a purpose. This was built for a reason. Which brings us nicely to the oval tub. It was carved out of one of the large pink granite blocks that made up the upper level of the pavement of the pit. Barsanti noted that certain measures had been taken to seal it. These measures are described as a layer of lime over the lid of the oval tub, followed by a bed of well-spread clay, which protected it from the overlying limestone blocks. These overlying limestone blocks had been placed regularly on the clay next to one another, so as to wrap the tub in a kind of insulating building. Sadly, no further information is given, and no drawings were made. As mentioned previously, we also know that 4,200 cubic metres of stone, rubble and sand were purposely thrown into the pit at some stage in its history, and we can rest assured that the tub was certainly sealed. The oval lid that covered the tub was also plastered to the tank, and on removal, the tub was empty. On closer examination, Barsanti noticed 
that inside the tub a 10 centimeter black band lined the side walls. These, he thought, might have been the evaporated deposit of some liquid offering. In Basanti's own words, he says, It has been hypothesized that this tank was an unused sarcophagus, but I cannot admit it. The care with which it had been protected proves that it contained something and the blackish deposit indicates the nature of this content. One would not have taken the precaution of concealing it under a huge mass of blocks if it had been empty then. Sadly, Barsanti didn't take a sample of this deposit, and we can only guess what it could have been. Barsanti does not recall the depth of the block that contained the oval tank, but he recorded the depth of the tank as being 2 cubits, which is around 1 meter, and its north-south length was 4 cubits. Around the top of the opening was a rim that protrudes 15 centimeters high and 19 centimeters wide. The lid had a recess cut out underneath to closely match the rim of the granite block. The lid was around 43 centimeters high and had four lifting bosses on its corners. And that is all we really know about the tub or tank. Barsanti believed it was a libation vessel, but with internal dimensions of roughly 2 meters by 1 meter by 1 meter, that would have been quite some offering. He also believes the lid would have served as an offering table, but this doesn't explain why it was sealed, covered in lime, then clay, then limestone blocks, and then a mass of stone, rubble and sand were thrown in. Why turn a beautifully crafted altar into an eyesore? I only came across this paper by Keith Hamilton since making my previous video, and this is the beauty of running a YouTube channel such as this, that people comment and help add to research, ideas and possible interpretations. I am still convinced that this particular geographical location is where water emerged from when the Great Pyramid acted as a water pump, but after reading the paper, I actually think that the pavement and the tub could have been a second stage of work. And this is all because of Barsanti's interpretation of a block being like a cork. The words used remind me of a structure at Abu Ghraib that we know covered a 180 foot hole that led to the groundwater. So maybe the Great Pyramid pump builders chose this area as an outflow location due to the underlying geology. I'm guessing that the bedrock was bored into to allow the outpouring of water. The giant granite cork was the plug. And if you don't believe the Great Pyramid water pump hypothesis, then maybe this location was chosen to create an artificial spring, dug into the hillside so that water could be released. This work could be truly ancient, done in pre-dynastic times, but was found by dynastic Egyptian kings. Maybe water was still seeping out of the ground around the plug, at the bottom of what would have been originally a crude pit and sloping corridor but maybe the water was coming out at a very slow rate. Seeing this, maybe the ancient architects of Old Kingdom Egypt viewed it as a holy site, or one of importance, and so turned it into a temple or a shrine, laying down beautifully polished stone inside the pit and turning the sloping ramp into a beautiful staircase. Interestingly, the L-shaped granite blocks inside the pit lead from the cork to the oval tub, and I wouldn't be surprised if the granite blocks were shaped and connected in such a way to channel the water from the cork feature to the oval tub, so the water flowed out at a steady rate, like an ancient water feature. It probably ended up looking just like this, a fabulous holy site in ancient Egypt. But then I am guessing something went terribly wrong. I'm guessing that for some reason the water pressure became stronger and instead of releasing a steady stream of water into the chamber, which I believe would have been slow enough to be absorbed by the limestone pavement within the pit and then transported back down into the ground, the amount of water became fierce. The tub was covered, not to protect the contents of the tub, but it was an attempt to seal it and stop the torrent of water from coming out and destroying the temple. They sealed the lid with mortar, covered it in lime and clay, and then piled limestone blocks on top. But I'm guessing the water kept coming, and the pit was filling faster and faster and couldn't drain away. So the last resort was to fill the pit temple with large blocks, rubble and sand, and bury the entire site to truly seal the lid and stop the water. Like I said, I think the original engineering was pre-dynastic, 
and it was found and adopted by old dynasty kings. They knew it was a place where water was seeping out of the ground and I believe they converted it into a temple. Yes, I might have a vivid imagination, but I can see a narrative here and a way to tie together all of the observations by Basanti. Of course, the water did eventually stop and the black residue is probably just from the accumulation of organic matter in the water. The water probably stood stagnant within the tub, which was the end of the outflow pipe, for many years, and as the water eventually drained away, as the water table dropped, the black residue was left behind. Before you knock my theory, which I'm sure many of you will, please read Keith Hamilton's paper and share your own ideas in the comments below. This is how we make progress by reviewing the evidence, hypothesizing and discussing ideas. If we can't do that, we may as well accept the Egyptological interpretation that it was simply a 4th dynasty tomb, an unfinished pyramid, and then move on. Thank you for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button, please subscribe, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.